Reality is not an ordered universe way to be perceived by the human mind. In other words, reality is the ordered universe God created and he revealed it to us. Rather, according to Kant, the human mind takes the chaos out there and orders and structures it into the reality that men perceive. So he shifted it from God to man, and the reality is in man's perceptions. It's not an objective reality, it's a subjective reality. He claimed that indeed perception is reality. You hear the idea of perception is reality? That was Immanuel Kant. Now it is true that people's perceptions is reality today. But that was not pre-modern thinking. Modernism affected it, where it shifted it back to man, away from God. And that changed everything, by the way. A lot of things are different today that we just accept, um, that, that we're not once that way. And I think people justify it by saying, hey, look at how much better our lives are. We've got all these things we can drive, we can fly. Our lives are so much better now because we have all these things. When actually what these things have done is shifted our thinking away from God to things to ourselves, to gratify ourselves. I think some of you may be thinking, I'm in the wrong era. I'm, I, I should be 300 years earlier when, uh, and you say, I don't care how hard it was then, at least at that time, people were thinking differently about God. And I understand we have freedoms in certain things today that we could be thankful for, but if you're free, in, in, in a sense, physically free, but you're actually trapped and, and subjugated in your minds, then you're more of a slave than you were. Okay? You're trapped, basically. The imagination of a transcendent reality is not stopped with the physical universe. Reality is more than just physical, but it's also moral. Okay? Part of the Creator's original design was the perception of right and wrong. Um, and this is a difference in thinking today. Moral laws exist as much as laws of nature. The world itself is a secondary reality patterned after an eternal world. In the mind of God, you see that in Hebrews 8 5. This world is a secondary reality, actually. The true reality is found in heaven, it's found with God. And everything that we see comes from His mind, comes from His thoughts, and He's revealing Himself to us through it. But a true understanding of the world starts with the knowledge of God through His revelation. This understanding is not revealed the answer to every question, that is, the general revelation does it, but it provides a view of the world in which all the particulars will fit. Uh, general revelation and the Word of God, they fit together. They're, they're coherent because he, God is a creator. He created everything. This is a coherent view. And this is God's world, Psalm 24, 1, and he does not deny himself, 2 Timothy 2, 13. And sometimes I'll argue about uh, moral laws, and I said that, you know, this is something that we should do. And other people are arguing about doctrine, they're arguing, and they somehow look at these as different. They're all the same. There's one God, there's one coherent truth, goodness, and beauty. They're all interrelated. You, you take one out, you're going to have a problem with the other two. Mm -hmm. Because they all work together. Because God is one. Now, the importance of the imagination, I, and I just, I noticed this big time recently, and I ended up putting it in my chapter, can be seen in, in the pivotal part it plays, the imagination, in the true worship of Israel. In fact, I'm going to have you turn there. I mean, we just hit it in Sunday school. So some of you who were with me in Sunday school would have already seen this, but if you weren't, then you're going to get, get something extra out of this. Turn back to 1 Chronicles. We don't need to really turn that much. First Chronicles 16 is what we're going to look at, but as I've been studying through this book and teaching it in Sunday school, you can see that a central part of First Chronicles is the Ark narrative in 13 through 16. And we can see the place of remembering in the work of the Levites. David had not remembered God's instructions for carrying the Ark. I know that people say, What's with him? What's with David? What was the problem? Why did David have a, build an ox cart to put the ark on? What, what was the point there? What was, as you move your way through, you see what his problem was. He wasn't thinking scripturally. I know you get down to, you know, saying whatever else it was, but he just was not looking at what God had recorded and thinking about what God had said, what he'd written. 
So you now remember that Uzzah died, of course, in 1 Chronicles 13. Uzzah reached up and touched the ark and got, and got killed by God. And he was reminded by that not to forget. And I said, sometimes you have your kids say, I forgot. I, I forgot. And then you say, well, this spanking is for forgetting. Because you've got to remember. You don't get to forget. You have to remember what, what I told you to do. What I said has to be bigger. Forget, I forgot doesn't work. Okay? And actually, I forgot wouldn't have worked with God. You know, I forgot about those staves that the priests were supposed to carry the ark on. The priests were supposed to be the ones carrying it. I forgot about that. He was reminded by that not to forget again. And he describes the responsibility of the Levites in 1 Chronicles 16.4. He says there, He appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record. This actually gives the threefold ministry of the Levitical office. It says to record to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. To record, to thank. And actually the Hebrew word record is found translated two different ways in this chapter. Look at verse 12. It says, remember his marvelous works. That word remember is the same Hebrew word as, re as record. And then look down in verse 15. Be ye mindful. That's also the same Hebrew word. And I, I would like to spend time, but I've already, I'm going to spend two or three weeks on First Chronicles 16 in Sunday School, so I'm not going to, be able to do that right now. But this is um, chiastic in its form. And remember is at the is actually at the apex. Okay. In other words, everything's flowing out of remember in the chapter, the whole chapter, into the Levitical worship. And blessing, blessings at the end of the chiasm. Okay, blessing of the people, blessing on David. Levitical worship regulated. Um, thank, a uh, praise, thanks, remember, remember is what it's about. And I look at this even chiastically, saying for the people in post-exilic Israel, the key for you is remember what God said. I think it according to His thoughts. Yeah. That that's the answer, to be mindful, to remember. What do they remember? Who God is. And who is he? He's a covenant-keeping God. He's a faithful God. He's merciful always. It's loving kindness. It's like I said, it's loving kindness. There's not really a word for love in the Old Testament like we have in the New Testament with agape. But it's actually God's mercy. His mercy endureth forever. God keeps loving you. It's interesting, by the way. Look back at 1 Chronicles 15. Look at verse 2. Look at the second half. I'm going to read verse 2. For them hath the Lord chosen... The Levites, and this is David now, Mr. Expert, after he blew it the first time. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. Forever? The Levites are ministering forever? What's that all about? That brings some mystery in there to me. I mean, I've thought about it, and what I believe it is, is that their, their worship is a shadow of an eternal reality. That's my first thought. That all worship is their worship. We're, and then the secondly, we're New Testament priests. You think of the Millennial Kingdom and the worship that's there, you think of the eternal worship. But this worship is all worship, that scriptural worship is a microcosm of Levitical worship. Levitical worship is the worship of God forever. Okay? His priests. And what is it? Remember, thank, praise. Remember, thank, praise. There it is. It all focuses on God. All right, and you can see that. Now, that's a rightly ordered imagination. And they speak not just of bare facts, but moving one. God's works of marvel, his wonders, the judgments that come from his mouth, his promises, his commandments. Like, for instance, down in verse 15, with, uh, be my voice of his covenant, um, his, his faithfulness in verse 12, his marvelous works, his wonders. In other words, if his works are marvelous, that means you're marveling. So... It's, it's affecting you emotionally. It's, it's, it, it's having an impact on you. But it starts with what? Remembering. Thinking. The right imagination. All right? And that's the key for Israel. It's a key for, for God's people. And you can, you, you, know, you can move into Romans 12, where it says to uh, present your body as a living sacrifice. But what's that based on? It's based on the right thinking, the renewing of your mind. Okay? Thinking the right thoughts. 
uh, th these things, he beseeches you based on things, these mercies of God. And you say the love of God and what he's done for you. This is the right thinking about God and what God, who God is and what he's done. What do you do? What's your right response? It's to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. So this, there's a symmetry to this, okay? Now let's think about the invisible universe. The physical universe itself is not enough to explain the world because there's more than a physical universe. Whatever you look out and see is not all there is. Most people today don't care almost exclusively about physical things. So when you talk to them about spiritual things, they're not interested. They're interested in mainly the physical world. And so they fill their lives up with physical things because that's the only world they believe in. And it's easy for them to keep operating under the illusion that they live only in that world in order to keep gratifying themselves with physical things. Romans 1 describes this as holding the truth in unrighteousness. Okay? I actually think my time is up. I just forgot about that. Okay? I'm, I'm just going to try to close it up here. Jesus, this was a problem, by the way, in Jesus' day with the Pharisees. Okay? They were looking for the, a certain kind of kingdom. Uh, not according to scripture, so they weren't recording or remembering or being mindful of what he said. And Jesus in Luke 17 says that, that the kingdom doesn't come with observable signs. It, comes, it doesn't come with observation. Because they were looking for, for some astronomical sign, which was understandable if you look at Joel chapter 2. They knew that the, when the kingdom came, there was going to be some sort of big thing happening. The sun, you know, the moon, and all that kind of stuff was going to happen. And they wanted that right now, and Jesus is explaining you're not getting the, the whole picture here. The kingdom of God, he said, is within you. And when he said within you, he wasn't saying, well, it's, it's within you Pharisees. He's saying, no, it's within, it's not without. So it's invisible. Okay? Where is the kingdom of God? Verse, verse 21, he says it. It's an internal spiritual kingdom in the age in which we live. And that's why the Lord has to be sanctified, 1 Peter 3.15, in your hearts sanctify him in your heart. In other words, Jesus has to reign as king in your heart. In your imagination, Jesus has to be king. The Pharisees and scribes of Jesus' day demanded signs, visible proof. And this is even in the illustration of the previous chapter. What did, what did the rich man in hell, who would have been a religious leader in the context, what did he expect to persuade his brothers? A visible sign Somebody came from hell. What does Abraham say? What does Jesus say to Abraham? He says, except they believe Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded. So, the imagination has to be ordered. Our reality has to be ordered by the Word of God. Because if you don't have it ordered by the Word of God, you're going to miss out on the entire spiritual dimension of the universe. You can't see the spiritual. You're not going to get the right picture just by looking at a physical universe. Mm -hmm. To get the right picture, you have to have your thoughts ordered by Scripture because that includes a spiritual universe. And your reality can be properly mapped. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. I know I've been just kind of whet your appetite. What I am going to do is I'll, I'm going to print out this chapter. And um, actually, I wasn't sure whether I was going to hand it out to every, anybody who wanted it. I was at least going to, some of you are feeling. Yeah, since I didn't finish it, I'm just going to have the whole chapter available. Obviously, it's going to be in the book later. I mean, you still need to buy the book or get the book later so we can make sure we can keep doing these books. But um, I do want you to see it because there's so much that I missed. But I felt like I needed a park on the fundamentals. Oh, we we're not going to get this. Okay? We're dismissed.